is a beloved member of our community, Jan Spatler. She is the current vice president on the board. She is one of our prayer chaplains. And Janice has a rich and full life. Um, she has been a counselor for over 20 years in private practice. She has her master's in counseling. She's a registered clinical counselor. And she just loves working one-on-one -on -one with people to have them see all their life can be and to transform and feel empowered about her choices, their choices. She also runs workshops and we're delighted whenever she comes to share her perspective on spirituality and growth and change with us. And now we've moved into the month of March. Our theme for the month is creating community. So please welcome Janice Butler as she shares with us. Oh, you don't this. Yeah, I'm good. Oh, perfect. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Quite honestly, I was sitting there and my jokes for the comedy show for tomorrow night were running through my head. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, wrong, wrong show. <laughs> so hopefully that character doesn't slip out. <laughs> oh, bring it all. Oh, oh, come on. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. I had to laugh because my sister, um, just an aside, I sent her a little message yesterday. Do you remember any funny stories from our childhood? And she says, well, I'll text if I think of one. And then like 14 <laughs> text pages later, there's all this, this stuff. But she said, remember when you took on that character where you were sitting on the couch? Me and my daughter often play at characters and I do this kind of smoky old woman, you know. My sister says, do the whole thing like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't do that this morning, though. Yeah. Okay, I will tell you one joke. Because it's one that was running through my head, and I'm not using it tomorrow night, because I want to, I want fresh material for tomorrow, right? So it, uh, this will be my like testing ground. Uh, if you laugh loud, maybe I will use it tomorrow. <laughs> but my dad was a milkman. He works in Lethbridge for Purity Dairy. They called him Purity Pete. You know, a lot of kids had eyes that looked a lot like his. <laughs> yes, I'm so grateful to be here. And so interesting, isn't it, that whatever I get to speak about, I get to experience and dive deep into. And so this theme is, I am, I am open to a deeper understanding of spirit within all people. We are one. And the first quote that came to my head was, alone we can do so little, and together we can do so much. And that's Helen Keller. And the, just this morning when Katie asked me to pray in with her, it was just her and I holding hands. I thought it feels much better to just hold hands with one person and know you're not alone, right? Yeah. When I was a kid, I grew up in a very colorful neighborhood. There were the next door neighbors who were Hungarian. They had beautiful gardens, beautiful flowers, beautiful vegetables, and I loved asking them. I never stole them. I asked for flowers for my hair, and I always had this bright flower in my hair all summer. And they were very kind to me and very generous. And then two doors down, my best friend Vera, she was Ukrainian, and their family would feed me these yummy, very different tasting things. And they would take me to these gatherings where people would wear beautiful embroidered clothing and dance joyfully. It was so fun. And then there were the Nanamiras. He was the landscape archetype for the Japanese gardens in Lethbridge. And his garden was like unbelievable. His grass was like carpet. And his bushes were shaped like deer and bunnies. And he had this fish pond. And as a little girl, and I'm talking like seven, eight, I'd go knock on the door and I'd say, can I go sit in your garden? And he'd always say, yeah, come on. And he'd take me back there. 
his wife would bring me some little Japanese crackers you know, with the little line, black lines in them. And I just sit there. I was so blessed. Every month or so, my mother would gather with this group of women that were all in the neighborhood and they'd have some kind of party. It was usually a birthday or an anniversary. And they would, someone would bake a really good cake and someone else would buy some kind of silly gag gift. And my mother would read tea leaves. So that was like the highlight of the party. And again, I was probably eight, nine, 10. I don't remember being like 13 and going. And I was an honorary member, only child. And it was just so beautiful. I loved sitting with those ladies. We just love to gather. No matter where we are, what we're doing, somehow we find a way of gathering together because our souls are crying out for that. It's such an innate, biologically driven need, actually, right? Um, you know, if we're all one, I was thinking, doesn't it make sense that we want to gather? Because then all the pieces and parts of us come together. And we get to see, we get to see each piece in its distinct beauty, but when it comes together, it's just this tapestry that's spectacular. So I think that's really one of the reasons we come together, to just see the beautiful, beautiful tapestry we made. Reg Bibby, who's a sociologist, studies religion, a leading sort of researcher on religion in Canada, who's one of my university professors, he said, all religious gatherings are about belonging. In his research, that's what he found. Underlying the need for people to come together is this need to belong. And, you know, this week I went to my brother-in-law's funeral and it was really, and I, this topic is on my heart, and I watched as people gathered his friends, his family, his neighbors, and they celebrated his life. And it was just really brought home to me the significance that if his wife was there by herself, what a sad and lonely thing that would be. And I think why it struck me when I was a girl, I used to work in nursing home, in a nursing home, and not, you know, not that often, but more than once or twice, myself and a few of the other staff would go to a funeral of one of the residents and we'd be the only ones there. Yeah. And as a young girl, because I started working there at 16, I, I remember sitting in these chapels with the casket at the front. Not another soul, except us few nurses that decided we'd go. And I, I could feel the sadness of their lives and of that reality. Though there were many reasons why that happened, the echoes of sadness still ran deep within me. We really wouldn't survive without each other. And there's been more research on belonging and survival in sociology and psychology than anything else, probably. And I love this little quote by <laughs> Leary et al. We have weak claws, little fur, and long childhoods. <coughs> Living in a group helps early humans survive harsh environments. Because of that, being part of a group still helps people feel safe and protected. Even when walls and clothing have made it easier for one man to be an island unto himself. My husband always says, this is his joke, it's better to go backpacking in a group and make sure that someone's a slower runner than you in case of a bear. <laughs> Pure survival instincts. Yeah, so physically, I don't think we could, you know, argue the fact that it's so important. And even emotionally, we can see how we support one another, especially through difficult times. But what is the spiritual purpose for gathering? Why is it that our souls want to come together? 
when I was young, <laughs> in my t early 20s, and that's like a long time ago now, getting close to over 30 years, I used to sing at a lot of weddings. And the popular song in the 70s was um, the wedding song, surprise, surprise. <laughs> you remember that? And one of the lines was, when two or more are gathered here, there is love. And I just love that line. And I think that's what happens. So if two or more are gathered, there is love. And if four or more is gathered, there's more love. And if 10 or more are gathered, there's more love. And if there's 50 or more, more love. And the more love, the more love. Research has proven that our environment has a serious impact on who we are as a person. Motivational speaker John Rohn said, we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. I think you've probably all heard that, right? So having that belonging in a strong network actually influences who you are. It reminds you what you're here for. You know, and we, we, we repeat these um, vision statements every week. And I know some people maybe think, why do we do that? <laughs> and I actually feel that's a part of bringing us together as one. Because when you go to the 12 step programs, Every single meeting, they say the 12 steps. And people used to complain and say, why do we always have to repeat the 12 steps? And I'd just be like, thank God for the 12 steps. <clears throat> thank God for our vision statements and mission statements. Because when we can just allow ourselves to sink into them, we become one in purpose. And that's really why we're here. Because alone, we can do so little, but together, we can do so much. Theodore Zeldin says, the conversation in communities is a meeting of minds with different memories, different habits. When minds meet, they don't just exchange facts, they transform them, reshape them, draw different implications from them engage in new trains of thought. The conversation in groups doesn't just reshuffle the cards, it creates new cards. And if you've ever done improv, because I love improv, it's so like that. I could stand up on the stage and be a fool myself, but if someone joins me, like it just is way more fun, number one. And number two, there's way more ideas. And then if a third person comes along and a fourth, like the sky's the limit and you can go anywhere, right? Last week, Sig was here speaking about marriage counseling and how to have a good relationship. That's, that's what he brings. Then Claude was leading a discussion on surviving transformation. This week I'm speaking, and Bob's talking about circles of faith. Anthony's offering music. No one of us could do all that. Um, I directed a lot of theater over the years, too. And, you know, there's me. I always felt like the orchestra conductor. I actually did very little. But my 14 costume people, my 10 set people, my makeup people, my props people, my light people, the orchestra, the actors, together we created something magical. And then the audience comes. It's another part of it. And together, <coughs> something magical happens. Me on my own? Not so much. People would get pretty tired if I sang and danced and did all the songs, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, it's so interesting that right alongside this need for belonging is a need for sovereignty and autonomy. <laughs> and, and this was always most curious to me as I was coupling or counseling couples. I wasn't coupling couples. <laughs> I'm not that kind of counselor. <laughs> but I do know one if you need one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll keep 
Ik had jou ook niet foto's. <laughs> yeah, so here we are. Craving belonging, craving to feel like we're connected. And the moment we become connected, we're like, you are so weird and you're so different and you're not like me at all. And so I want to disconnect from you. Yeah. So I got thinking about that challenge and, and I think it really is the challenge of humankind. How do we have a feeling of healthy belonging while at the same time remain sovereign and hold our own autonomy, right? Yes. You know, I think a lot of it boils down to how safe we feel. <coughs> Not how safe the other people make us feel. Because if you're looking for safety outside yourself, you're going to end up, you know, longing, dissatisfied, frustrated. And often I would run women's circles and the women would say to me, I can't come this time because she's coming. I just don't feel safe with her. And I'd say, bring your own safety. Bring your own safety. On Maslow's Hierarchy of Human Need, if any of you have seen that, under food, clothing, shelter, basic needs, the second thing is safety. Physical safety, emotional safety, spiritual safety. And Albert Einstein said, the most important decision any of us will ever make is whether or not the world is a safe place. So it's worth investigating, how can I feel safe within myself before we start bringing ourselves into connection where we like, can you please make me safe? It's, that's about taking responsibility. That's the autonomy that I'm talking about. Is that if we can be one with ourselves, it's much easier to join and be one with another. But if we're all over the place and thinking, but I need you to make me whole, we're gonna come into that union with a whole lot of expectations. The other person won't even know you have them because they're usually not communicated. And then, you know, the disconnection starts and that sense of belonging you're so craving just is crumbling. So take responsibility for our own emotions. Notice what's happening inside yourself. You know, and this comedy show has been a good practice for that because I'm doing it with my friend Sheila and our other friend Diane and everybody's having their own reactions. And uh, I think at the end of yesterday, it was safe to say 10 out of the 10 people thought they weren't funny. Right? <laughs> we all went home, I'm not funny. <laughs> And so how we each process that is different because some people would, you know, get upset and be yelling at everybody and, and other people just get quiet and self away. And all of that is sort of breaks down connection and, and that sense of belonging. As soon as you start speaking, the truth for me is, I felt really uncomfortable. I don't think I'm, and you just start owning well, in my body, I just felt all this, ugh. And you, t you notice yourself. You take responsibility for yourself. The other person starts doing it. And the two of you start to connect. You may not have to be the same in your responses, but you're the same in taking responsibility and noticing. And there's no barrier because you're not blaming one another. So I think one of the greatest gifts that we have is that if we don't come together in groups, we would never know our shadows. <laughs> I really believe that. Would you, you know, if I sit at home in my closet <laughs> with my shadows, <laughs> I'm sitting at home and my shadows are getting bigger. It's getting darker in the room but I still can't see them. Cause I'm like, 
something out there is scary. So I'm just going to hide here in my shadow. When I come into a group, I got 50 mirrors who <laughs> their light and shadow reflects to me my light and shadow. So when I look at Alara and I just see beautiful radiance, I too have to own that. And not that this is true, but <laughs> if I looked at her and thought, oh, she's so arrogant, <laughs> I too have to own that. And I would never have seen that unless she brought it. And every single client that comes to my office brings the gift of that reflection for me. And that's what the whole Banopa prayer is all about. Everyone that comes before you is for you, especially the really irritating <laughs> ones, the ones that make you crazy, that you're like, I want to get away from you. They are the ones who want to teach you, who want to show you, and you call them in. You call them in. And so in the group, we learn about ourselves. I see myself more clearly as I see you more clearly. And the more clearly I can see myself, the more clearly I can see you. And the more I know myself, the less I need you to be anything other than you. And that creates a sense of oneness. Have you ever, I had this experience, and I might have told you guys, I, I'm starting to feel like Doug Craig, who speaks so often, the stories, mm. did I tell them that story already? <laughs> but I was um, walking in my hometown of Cornell, and there was, they were having a lot of trouble at the high school. My, my husband was a teacher, and they had sort of switched schools, and this group of native kids that were coming being bused from all over, they, they decided they weren't gonna go to school. And they so they kind of formed this gang and they were just hanging out outside of the school, about 30 or 40. And it, you know, it was a concern for the school, of course, and everybody. Well, I'm walking downtown one day and lo and behold, I kind of run into them, right? And in my shadow places, I saw only separation. What are they doing here? What's going on with them? Why aren't they where they're supposed to? And my mind just went on this big judgment about how come they weren't where they were supposed to be. And, and I got in my car and I took a breath and I said, Janice, I want you to think about how they're feeling. And as I breathed into that, I got a sense of displacement disconnection, being forced to do something you don't want to do, not feeling like you fit. And I actually wept. And in that moment, I became one with those teenagers. Because have I ever felt that? You bet your life I have felt that. Have I ever felt like I didn't belong? We all have the archetype of the outcast. Trust me. Everybody carries some of that energy of being the outcast. And when I connected into that with that group of young people, I became one with them. And you know what was left? Love. All I felt for them was love. And a deeper understanding of myself and of them. Thank goodness they came in a group to me. Thank goodness I could see my shadows. Yeah. Turn your page, turn your page. Oh, yeah, I remember sitting in a board, not a board meeting, a, uh, a meeting, this was, this was somewhere else, a while ago, and someone said something and it really triggered me. <laughs> and I was like, oh! Oh, I'm just so mad at that person. Why did they say that? And I went on this wild rampage in my head. <laughs> and, and then someone started to share. And they started to share with such vulnerability. And they were just, you know, telling the truth about where they were at. And as soon as that happened, my heart opened. I forgot I was angry. 
And in that moment, I connected with this person and I, I could feel what they were sharing and I felt so connected. Being in the group brought me out of my isolated sense of disconnection and I'll say better than this into connection to what really matters. That's what's really important about coming together. That's why we repeat our mission statement to remind us why we're here and what really matters. You know, if each of us could come, if each of us could come and bring our holy divine self, we could create so many miracles. But realistically, we come and we bring our diverse human selves, full of emotions that change in a moment, full of angst, full of whatever's going on for us in our lives. And that's what we bring. And if we can be responsible for that ourselves, we can have compassion because everybody else is bringing them whatever they've got going on. And together we feel not so alone and not so hopeless, right? You know, being on the board, I just have to mention that your board and your spiritual leadership team really love you. And I've had the opportunity to watch very different personalities, strong people with different ideas and different backgrounds and ways of looking at the world come together with one purpose. And this is the oneness. And they focus on the one purpose and that's serving this community. And they bring with them all that they are, all the colorful costumes they wear, and they, they work it out because they have one purpose, and that's to serve. If I remember my divine purpose, it helps me wherever I go. And then I recognize you're not against me. You're my gift. Thank you for showing me all my shadows. So grateful for that. What I really want you to know <clears throat> is that we learn about ourselves in community. And if you sit there feeling like you don't belong and no one ever talks to you when you come, <clears throat> tuck into your outcast and say, wow, sweetie, you're really feeling alone. Be kind to yourself about that. The kinder you can be to yourself, the more you can open in compassion to another. And I'm really grateful for this community and the opportunity to know myself better, learn about who I am through each of you and all that you show me and all that you teach me. Or we're all in this together, right? And alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. Thank you. We're just gonna sing the meditation song three times, and then I'll lead you in a meditation.
take some nice deep breaths. <clears throat> Allow those breaths to nourish your body. And as you bring in the breath, imagine yourself just opening and creating space within yourself. More space for love. More space for light. And with each breath, go deeper and deeper into the truth of who you are.
bring yourself back to this time, this space. Forward for having the experience of connecting to your own oneness and your own oneness with all. Blessings to you. So. That was often my own little meditation space there. <laughs>